I am here to encourage you this morning. You can have a new marriage with the same spouse. You can have a different marriage with the same spouse. You can have a better marriage with the same spouse. I love what the Jeffreys say in that video. God loves to redeem. God loves to restore. God loves to reconcile. And that's the desire of our church. And today we're going to talk about marriage. And let me tell you this, by the way. The best time to save your marriage is before your marriage starts. That's why in a few weeks we're going to be having a premarital counseling interest meeting. This is if you think you're going to be getting engaged soon, if you're engaged, if you just want to know more about how we approach marriage and premarital counseling, we want you to show up to this interest meeting, and uh, it's going to be an incredible time. But before we get started today, we have to talk about something. I have to talk about something that's on everybody's mind, and it's obviously the storms and the devastation that has happened in Boone and Nashville and all over Asheville and all over Western North Carolina. And uh, and, I, and some people have said, well, what are you guys doing about this? Well, the first thing I want you to know is that as a church, we have a comprehensive view of how to care for people, right? People are a soul. This is a good way to think about yourself. You're a soul in a body, in a community. And the church is called to care for all three of those. And so one of the things we've been thinking through is how can we partner with the Big C Church to come alongside those who need help and hope and healing in Western North Carolina. The first thing we did, I want you to know, because of your generosity, yesterday our church gave $25,000 to Baptist on Mission, their hurricane relief fund. So that's the first thing we're gonna do. So thank you guys, yeah. That's because, because all of you are consistently generous, we were able to just do it right away, okay? The second thing I want you to know is that our missions team, okay? We don't just have like one person on staff that thinks about missions all the time. We have a couple people on staff that they think about missions all the time. And it's complex, and we're trying to figure out what's going on and the best way to help, and they're assessing the needs, and we're going to be in touch with community groups on how you can help. Now, if you want to help right away, if you're like, Kyle, give me something to do, text RELIEF to 39808. You can do that right now. If you text RELIEF to 39808, we're going to send you a link, and you can fill out an interest form, and you can donate, and you can see needs, and you can do something right now. Uh, But we're going to be trying to figure out and follow up with all of the needs in the weeks and months to come. The big thing we're going to do right now is we're just going to pray because what, what do you do, right? What do you do when, like, you know, you can't even get to Asheville right now? Like, you know, what are you going to do? And how would we pray? There's so many needs. Well, one of the things we're going to pray is we're going to pray for the church to be strengthened and for the church to be the hands and feet of Jesus in Western North Carolina. Will you pray with me? Let's pray. Lord, I want to just take a moment, and I want to thank you for uh, pastors, nonprofit leaders, Christians all over Western North Carolina. I want to thank you for members of our church who I know have already, a couple, have already gone up to Boone. Lord, and the needs are enormous. Um, people need fresh water. People need food. People are without power. People don't know where certain family members are when we get out to the Asheville area, Lord. And so we pray that the church would be the church, Lord. We pray that you would use this for, uh, to, to bring people to faith in Christ. We, we pray that you would do this to strengthen and unite the churches to meet the physical and the spiritual needs of the people in their community. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, guys, it's been, here we are, we're week four of the Multiply Initiative. Grab your Multiply Moleskin if you haven't. We're gonna be getting more of those back in, but we are in week four, and I already talked about biblical manhood, and I talked about biblical womanhood, and today we're gonna talk about marriage. Now, here's what's interesting. At the 11 o'clock service last week, well, after the 11 o'clock service, this young couple, they're super excited, and they see me in the lobby, and they, they walk up to me, well, they kind of more run up to me, and they say, Pastor Kyle, I gotta tell you something. I said, what? And the young lady puts her hand out, and she says, we're the first couple to get engaged in the Multiply Initiative. (laughs) I said, let's take a picture, okay? (laughs) Now, here's what I want to tell you. There are many signs of a healthy church, okay? Let me give you, so some people think, what what is a healthy church? Lots of, you know, lots of believers that are being strengthened, lots of new baptisms that are happening. That's true, but let me tell you another sign, This is how you know a church is dead and dying. They don't have this anymore. Babies and weddings, okay? So part of the Multiply Initiative is something else we're launching today. You've heard, probably, of MAGA, Make America Great Again, right? Maybe you've heard of Bobby Kennedy. He came along and he said, all right, there's MAGA, but then there's MAHA, Make America Healthy Again. Well, today we're launching (laughs) MAHA. It's hard to say. It's fun to say, though. MAHA. Make marriage great again. Okay, that's what we're going to do. Turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 2. It's impossible, impossible to say you can make too big of a deal of marriage. You can't. I know it makes people insecure. We'll talk about that in a little bit. You can't make a big enough deal of marriage. Why? It's the primary picture of Jesus Christ in the church. It's the way the Bible begins. The Bible begins with a wedding and a marriage. Adam and Eve. The Bible ends 
with a wedding and a marriage, Christ and the church. Jesus does his first miracle at a wedding. Jesus talks exhaustively. Quoting the passage we're gonna talk about today, he talks about marriage all the time. But here's what happens when you talk about marriage. And we've been kind of doing it with biblical manhood and womanhood. And we're gonna talk about it this week, okay? And we're gonna talk about it next week, okay? Because it shows up again in Genesis 3 and there's everything's dysfunctional and there's temptation and role reversal. We'll get there next week. So if I don't say everything that you want me to say this week, you know, keep coming back, okay? I'll be there next week. Um, but here's, here's what marriage is. Marriage is, especially Genesis 2, get ready for this. Marriage is an ideal. Like, well, I'm gonna show you today the perfect marriage of the first husband and the first wife and naked and unashamed and one flesh and holding fast. And here's what everything, every time you hold up the ideal, it does two things to people. They love it and they hate it. Why? Because the ideal says, this is what you should shoot for in your life. This is something to aim at. This would be a great vision for your life. You know, you only get seven or eight decades and you're gonna die. Why don't you aim at the highest thing you could aim at? And so what marriage does is it says, so this is a great goal and a great potential. It's not for everybody, obviously, but it's a great goal to aim for. But then here's what an ideal does. It, it gives us something to aim at. And man, do you need that? Otherwise you'll be hopeless, depressed, and nihilistic, and that won't be helpful to anybody, especially you. Um, it, but then what, a, what an ideal does is it constantly shows you where you're falling short. It constantly shows you where you need grace. Because when we, when we hold up the ideal of marriage today, some of you are gonna go, my marriage is so, uh, so horrible compared to what the picture of marriage should be. Then a whole other group's gonna say, well, I'm single. And I want marriage and it feels so far out of reach. And so, listen, as we talk about marriage, there's a lot of different people in, in the room today, right? There's people who are single and they desire marriage. Let me tell you another thing I've learned as being a pastor, because for you know, 10 years I did college ministry, so I didn't know this is like the amount of people in our church in their 50s and 60s who are heartbroken over at least one of their kids. It's like, you know, man, what is gonna happen with him and what is gonna happen with her? And part of they're saying, are they, are they ever going to get married? Are they ever gonna have a family? What's going to happen? That happens. Some of you have just hard marriages and of course marriage is unbelievably hard. You know, and maybe your sexless roommate's raising kids, right? And maybe you're living two separate lives and I don't know, maybe there's things you haven't dealt with in a decade, and it's like, oh, who wants to deal with all of that? So the people have hard, people are afraid of marriage, right? I mean, it's like you saw, I don't know, your parents, they had a horrible marriage, or, you know, we live in a society that's afraid of commitment. You've heard of, you know, FOMO, right? Fear of missing out. Have you heard of FOBO? Fear of a better offer. And a lot of people, when it comes to marriage, they have FOBO, right? Because when you say yes to one, you have to say no to everybody else. That's a lot of people to say no to before you ever meet them. And then there's other people and they're not so much afraid of marriage. They, they were in a marriage and now they're single again. You ever, you know Chris Rock, he's not a Christian if you didn't know that, okay? Chris Rock, the comedian. <clears throat> but he does tell the truth because that's what funny comedians do, they tell the truth. And uh, he was talking about, he got divorced, you know, and it was horrible, I guess. And, and he said, people ask me, imagine saying this, people ask me, Chris Rock says, if I'd ever get married again, and here's my answer, I wouldn't get married again if it cured cancer. How horrible was your marriage? And still, I probably don't say this enough. We've got a lot of people in here who have great marriages. And if you have a great marriage, not a perfect, no one has a perfect marriage, come on. But if, you have, if, it's, you know, it's, if it's good, if you're thriving, not just surviving, okay? If you've dealt with your issues and you're moving toward one another, let me just encourage you, you give everybody in this church hope. And so today what we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about two things, but half my sermon, get ready, is gonna be on marriage. And the other half of my sermon is gonna be on how to move from single to spouse, how to move from me to we, how to move from one person to one flesh, because man, do people need help with that. So both the single people listen carefully to the first part, and married people listen carefully to the second part, and switch back and forth. So, okay, let, let's look at this. You gotta see this. Genesis 2, verses 21 to 25. All right, so the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, that's Adam. And while he slept, he took one of his ribs and he closed up its place with flesh. We read this last week, but you'll see. <clears throat> and the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, this is at last bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, in light of everything that was just said, <clears throat> and by the way, here it is. This is the best definition of marriage we have in the Bible. This is the most referenced definition of marriage we have in the Bible. Here it is. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, 
And they shall become one flesh, and the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Okay. Couple things I want you to know about marriage, because we live in a really confusing time, right? You're like on the college campus today, and someone's like, why do we need marriage? Like, uh, I, I, I don't know, because we've been assuming it. We've been assuming it for hundreds of years, and now we have to articulate something as basic as marriage? Well, good luck. Well, I'll try to help us. The first thing is, marriage is God's idea. Right? Adam doesn't wake up and be like, man, this is, I'm living all alone. Can you create this thing called marriage that would produce children and we could, you know, a, a covenant of companionship with one another? I, Adam doesn't ask for it. Eve doesn't ask for it. Marriage is God's idea. But then this is another thing you have to understand. Marriage is more than a relationship. I know people, hey, we'll get there. Well, it's a relationship. It's a relationship between one man and one woman for one lifetime. Okay, we'll get there. <clears throat> it's actually, from the biblical mindset, it's an institution, Okay, I gave you some big words today because uh, you came to church, so here's some big words. It's a creation ordinance. In other words, it's given before sin enters the world and it's given to everybody. It's like, okay, it's not, marriage isn't just for Christians. Now, Christians should marry Christians. We'll talk about that. Non-Christians, if they get married, they marry non-Christians. But marriage is an institution given to humanity for their flourishing, so God created three institutions, and everyone's confused about this, but let's just explain it. God created the family, God created the church, and God created the government, okay? And they all work together. The point of the family, like, you know, what is the point of the family? Obviously, to raise the next generation, to care for them, to educate them, to grow them in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Okay, that's what the family does. We don't want the government doing that. Okay, and then the family comes along, that's the first institution, and then God creates the church, and the church is to come alongside the family, that's what the church is. If you don't know this, all this church is is a family of families. And then the government comes along, if it's, if it's rightly oriented, and a lot of times it's not, but if the government's rightly oriented, it says, okay, great, my job is to do safety and order and justice to secure the peace and prosperity of the church and the family. Well, praise the Lord. Anyway, that's how that all works together. Now, what I want you to see in the first um, marriage is actually to have the first wedding. Did you notice this is actually a wedding? Okay, because here's the interesting thing about, about Americans. We don't have any rituals anymore. Have you noticed that? Like, we have no rituals. It's like, okay, your graduation ceremony in high school and college when you're a senior, that's like it. The only other one we have left is marriage. And we do all these things in marriage, we have no idea why we do them, right? We're still overwhelmed by them. It's like, we have no idea why the father walks the daughter down the aisle, but wow, when it happens, we cry and we stand. It's like, it's from this text. That's, why, that's where it came from. God is the first father. Eve's had a big day, right? She's created and gonna get married on the same day. Um, <coughs> God is, God is the first father, and he walks his daughter down the aisle, and then he's the first pastor. God is the first father, and God is the first pastor. He both walks his daughter down the aisle, and then he officiates the wedding. Because I'm a pastor and because I'm a dad to a daughter, this is exactly what I hope to do one day. Walk my daughter, Addie, down the aisle, and then turn around and officiate the wedding. That's what God does. And he brings them together. Okay, now, um, it's interesting because we got to talk about what marriage is now, okay? So we, I kind of showed you the ceremony. I showed you that marriage is an institution. But then we have to talk about marriage because, okay, here's the definition of marriage, okay? It's, we've lost a lot of this, but a marriage is a covenant between one man and one woman for one lifetime. Now, I want to talk about how our culture thinks about marriage today because let me give you these things that people say about marriage, and this is going to explain why we are where we are. The first thing that's cynical Right? Cynical people say this, and it's a cliche. And obviously, they heard their friends say it, okay? So here's what it is. I don't need marriage. I don't need a piece of paper. You ever heard that? I don't need a piece of paper to show my love for another person. It's like, you don't need a piece of paper? Are you kidding? Do you know how hard marriage is? Do you know what that piece of paper represents? That piece of paper represents you. You invited a pastor to officiate your wedding. That piece of paper represents the ceremony that you had when you invited every person that was important in your life and you said, get here, I need you to see an important commitment I'm gonna make and then I need you to hold me accountable to it for the rest of my life. Silly modern people, I don't need a piece of paper. Yes, you do. Secondly, marriage, here's another way that people view marriage, ready? Marriage is a prison, right? The old ball and chain. My brother, he, he's a member of the country club up north. He, 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 he was all excited. He's getting married. He goes in the men's locker room, tells a couple old guys. That's a mistake, right? He tells a couple of old guys in the, you know, grumpy old guys in a country club locker room. He says, I'm getting married. One of the old guys says to him, son, you're breaking into prison. All the husbands are like, can I laugh at that? Um, <coughs> uh, <laughs> okay, 
Marriage is viewed as a prison because, well, I'll tell you something interesting. I, I was listening to this interview by this economist. I, I don't remember all the details of this, okay, but I remember the main points. This lady was being interviewed on why men aren't getting married. And it was really fascinating. And she wrote a whole book on this. I can't remember what it's called. Anyway, she's, she has all this data, data-driven approach to why men aren't getting married. And, and well, you know the first reason men aren't getting married. The first reason men aren't getting married is they do view it as a prison sexually. They view it as the end of their financial or sexual freedom, not the beginning of it. And now there's all these options outside of marriage. So that's the number one reason. Number two reason though is, and she shows this with studies and data, what the average wife expects of her husband in 2024. I mean, just think about what the average wife expects today compared to what her mother expected, compared to what her grandmother expected, compared to what her, the expectations that women have on men. Very, very difficult. Number three, the legal system is horrible for men if the marriage doesn't work out. It's like, all right, irre irreconcilable differences. Okay, you know, we're still in court and I'm still not getting custody of the kids and I'm still gonna be paying somebody for the rest of my life some money. That's how men view it. So people view it as a prison. Um, oh, this is important. Some people view it as not a priority. Okay, people are like, I, you know, I gotta go to medical school and I gotta get my grad degree and I gotta, you know, live in New York City as a single person and, you know, eat at all the cool restaurants and drink at all the cool bars. And, and basically, people dismiss marriage. They're like, okay, and here, here this, listen, and I don't wanna discourage anyone. I know some single people, but we'll get to you in a little bit. Okay, but listen, um, people, this is so important. And I'm really, really speaking to the people in their like late teens, early 20s. I wanna tell you this, and people who have kids this age. People dismiss marriage and then they miss marriage. How many opportunities do you get to have a romantic relationship in your entire life? How many? Three to six. Think about it. You've gotta meet someone and there has to be mutual interest of some kind. Then you have to take the awkward first steps of seeing if there is interest, you think there is. Then you have to get to know each other and if that goes well, then you have to meet your friends and family. Well, and if that doesn't go well, then you break each other's hearts and then there's three to six months to recover from that. And then you hope that then you gotta start all over. How many times do you get to do that in your life? Answer, three to six times. So what am I trying to tell young people? If it, if like, dude, if it comes along, it is so important. It is like, forget everything else in your life and begin to work on this. That's how important it is. The final thing is there are new possibilities in people's lives now, right? There's cohabitation, which I don't have time to get into. I've spoken against it, okay? You know, cohabitation is when you say with your body what you haven't said with your life. And here, here's just, I'm not, look, I'm not this like indie fundy guy yelling at people who are living together. Listen, here's what I'm doing. Um, here's what I want you to know about cohabitation, because I'm more, it's amazing, the more I do this, hear this, hear this terribly, the more I do this, the more confident I am in everything that I've ever taught, because all I do is do pastoral ministry, and then I see the brokenness of how everything else people try to do that's apart from God's word doesn't work. So here's the thing about cohabitation that you need to know, and some of you are here and you're cohabitating, and you're just gonna feel awkward just for the next minute, just hold on, okay? All right. um, it's not just sinful, it's stupid. Like, you know, yeah, I don't care what the Bible says. Okay then just hear me say this, it's stupid. What I mean by that is it doesn't work. That every secular study shows that if you cohabitate before you get married, you're more likely to get divorced. Why? Because you can't practice marriage. That's like young people need to, I, I can't practice marriage. No, you can't. You can't practice having one last name. You, you can't. You can't practice having one life and one bank account. You can't do it. You can't practice having one vision. And so I wanna give you from the text a threefold definition of marriage. Then we're gonna to move to single people. Uh, um, I want you to see, in fact, look here, just go to it. Um, this is gonna be in uh, chapter two. We're just gonna read verses 24 and 25. Therefore, a man shall leave. So men need to grow up. Marriage is for men. A man shall leave his father and his mother. Look, here's the three words, okay? <clears throat> and hold fast. Underline that word if you underline it, if you feel comfortable underlining your Bible. Hold fast to his wife. That's the first component of marriage. And they shall become one flesh. That's the second component, if you underline. So there's three key phrases. Hold fast, one flesh. Here's the third one. And the man and his wife were both, here it is, naked and not ashamed. Okay, let's talk about these, okay? The three parts of marriage, if you take notes, are covenant, cohesion, and consummation. Covenant, cohesion, and consummation. And this is the best definition of marriage that we have in the Bible. Okay, covenant. Basically, hold fast means to be super glued together. 
okay? So this is the idea of commitment. Now, we are afraid of commitment in our culture. We talked about that already a little bit. But I want to talk about this. So here's, here's what a marriage is. A marriage is a covenant, not a contract. So some of you are, I know you guys, you're in law and you're in business and you're in finance and you're in real estate. And like all day, all you deal with is contracts. Contra contracts are amazing, <laughs> right? Contracts are amazing in the business world. It's like, all right, sign on the dotted line and this is what you get and this is what I get. And <laughs> did you see the exception clause? Okay, got it. If you break this and I get this and if I break this, then you, I mean, that's a contract. Contracts work great in the business world. They don't work good in the home at all, okay? A covenant is something completely different. Here's what you say in marriage. This is what you say in marriage. If you don't know you said this, this is what you said when you stood up there. You say, I am committed to you and all the ways you will change. We need to move in the church to covenantal thinking in marriage, not contract thinking in marriage. Let me get, you, want it, you want the number one example of co uh, contract thinking in marriage? Do you want it? Here it is. The prenuptial agreement. Let's get our divorce situated before we get our marriage started. This is why the vows are so important. So I don't do a lot of premarital counseling anymore. I don't do a lot of weddings anymore. I did a ton in the first like five years of this church. And every time I did premarital counseling, you know, I did the same, I give the same spiel all the time. But I'm basically like, hey guys, listen, the number one thing we need to do, welcome to premarital counseling and I wanna talk to you guys. But okay, here's the number one thing I need you guys to work on. What are gonna be your vows? And I'm like, don't write your own vows. You know, it's like, that's my opinion. It's like, don't write your goofy, like, I will never burn the cookies. You know, I will laugh at all your jokes. It's like, stop that. Like, you need the for better or worse and sickness and death. You need what the church has always said. That's what you need. And the reason is, so the point, okay, why do people go to a wedding ceremony? They're like, well, go, go, great. This is, it's in Keogh Island and it's an open bar and the, her parents are rich. We're going, right? <laughs> that's, that's why you, yeah, you all laugh. That's why you go to a wedding. That's fine. <laughs> um, the, the point of going to a wedding, though, seriously, like from a theological standpoint, the point of the wedding is basically I need somebody to see these vows. That's the whole point. So I know it's like 10 minutes of the service, and I know you had to get a hotel and get a flight and drive there and all that. Literally, the point is let's get as many people that we know and love in a room to watch us make these vows. And the reason why you have to understand that marriage is a covenant is because of a very simple fact that marriage is way too hard for one of you or both of you to have an escape clause or a way out. The only way, I promise you, the only way that you're going to be able to deal with all of the horrible things, all of the snakes and surprises that arise in each of your lives is you're gonna have to go, all right, we're locking the doors, we're not leaving. And you, you have to have, this sounds pessimistic, but it's actually very optimistic. You have to be like this. We are going to be married to each other for the next 40 years or maybe 50 years, and so we better figure this out. And the only thing that's gonna make me have a conversation with you that's gonna cause you to get angry, that's gonna cause you to cry, that whatever, that we're gonna be up till three in the morning. The only way I'm going to do this is if I know I'm not leaving. And I know you're not leaving, and so then we can really bear our souls and explain who we are. So <clears throat> the first thing is the vows. The, the second thing, and, that's, and that's, that's covenant, the second is cohesion. So it says that we become one flesh. This is hard to explain. But the Bible says that when two people get married, a new reality now exists. So like as soon as you get married, I mean, you're individuals before the Lord, I'm saying, but you, are, you become one flesh. And the purpose of marriage, and this will be the adventure and the achievement of your life if you can do it, is to basically figure out how can two people become one flesh? Like what you try to do in marriage is you try to become practically and progressively what God already says you are positionally. So, so it, and it takes a lot, right? And by the way, this is a word for some of you, okay? Um, it is harder to become one flesh, in my opinion, this is what I've seen in 20 years of ministry. It is harder to become one flesh the more money you have. Why? Because it's easier to live separate lives. Poor people can't live separate lives. Are you kidding me? But the common in the north, someone told me in the northwest right now, like in, in the Washington area and Portland and all that area, a very common feature in houses are two master bedrooms. The more money you have, oh, he takes his vacation and she takes her vacation and he has his wing of the house and she has her wing of the house. The, what you need to do in marriage is you need to figure out, like, and this is part of the covenant that leads to the cohesion, you have to figure out, this, this is a great conversation to have with your spouse. How could we have the best marriage possible? I mean, why not try to do that? 
What would, what would it look like if you could have everything you wanted in this marriage and I could have everything I wanted in this marriage? What if we were thrilled with this marriage? Thrilled. What if we could be sophisticated enough to architect a life that was win-win? And then when you bring kids into the home, then that's really sophisticated. How can all of us win? How could all of us be so pumped to be a part of this family that we, would, we wouldn't want to be anything other than in this family because in this family, everybody's doing better? You can feel that as I say it. That's exactly what you want, which is the third thing, consummation. Okay, this is not a sermon on sex. We did a whole series on sex. But the Bible does hear... Now, listen, the culture has it backwards. They think sex before or without marriage. The Bible teaches marriage, then sex. I want to just say something really quickly, and then we have to move on um, about, about sex. So it says they were naked and unashamed, okay? And, and then we see in the next chapter, the Bible uses the language of knowing one another um, for, for the sexual language in the Bible. Here's what I want you to know, that uh, sex has three purposes, okay? So the world thinks sex only has one purpose, recreation, uh, pleasure. Uh, now, that's a purpose of sex. In the Song of Solomon, there's no mention of kids, so we know that's a purpose of sex. A second purpose of sex is reproduction. And we live in a culture that's trying to divorce not only marriage from sex, but sex from children, but that's the second purpose of marriage. And most people still, if all they need to do take is biology 101 and they get that. Um, the third purpose of marriage is renewal. This is hard to explain. Um, marriage, sex in marriage is the covenantal sign Oh, it's the Lord, this is gonna sound weird to say. It's the Lord's Supper and the baptism of the marriage. It's the way you visibly see and show the one flesh union, obviously. But sex doesn't fix anything in a marriage, right? <clears throat> like that, that's like a guy's, you know, I don't know, an 18 year old guy's thought, oh man, just more sex would fix everything. It's like, ah, it doesn't. Sometimes sex makes, it doesn't make every relationship better. What sex is, sex is the barometer in the marriage of how the entire marriage is going. I had a friend, he's a Christian counselor. He basically said, yeah, that's what I tell couples. You will know the quality of your overall relationship. It will be shown in your sexual relationship. Why? Because what is sex? Among other things, it's like the highest form of play. And you can only play when all of your other needs are met. And so that's marriage. It's covenant, it's cohesion, it's consummation. It's something to aim for. Now with the rest of our time, I want to talk to the single people, okay? And it's connected because I need to talk about this because there's a lot of people in here who are single and we love the single people and I'm gonna say this in a few minutes and it's fine if you're single your whole life and Jesus was single and Paul was single but I know a lot of you desire marriage and so what I thought is I'd just take the last part of the sermon and I would talk about how to move from single to spouse. And, and the reason I say this is because if you turn to Genesis chapter two, you're like, if you, were, if you watch the story, of, if you're watching you know, Adam and Eve, okay, and you're watching the Genesis chapter two wedding and marriage, is it not the most boring episode of The Bachelor ever? You're like, who's gonna end up with who? It's like there's two people. Adam gets Eve, Eve gets Adam, right? There's no dating app. There's no broken heart. There's no terrible backgrounds. There's no former relationships. It's like we don't, you know, I wish we lived in a Genesis 2 world. You wish you lived in a Genesis 2 world. Unfortunately, we live in a Genesis 3 world. So how do we move from single to spouse? Well, the Bible doesn't give us one way. Like sometimes the Bible gives you a very clear path and it gives you a very clear command. And I think the reason the Bible doesn't give you one way to move from single to spouse or one person, one flesh, is that God knew that his word would spread and his church would multiply and that at different seasons and different societies, at different times and different cultures, you are going to need to move, figure out different ways to move from one person, one, one flesh. Now, why am I talking about this? Because you, you, basically, guys, get ready. I still have, I'm not kidding you, get ready. I still have 15 more points to share with you. I'm gonna go as quick as I can, but this is, I went back and forth. Do I do this? Do I not do this? Do I do this? Do I not do this? Here's why I'm doing this. Because, and I'm gonna go quick, but I got, a, I got an email uh, last week from a guy, listen to this. He was visiting us at the launch of the Multiply Initiative. So if you weren't here a couple weeks ago, we launched this massive Multiply Initiative. And, and I said a bunch of things. Guys need to get married and, and people need to have kids and people need to lose weight and people need to get out, out of their dead end jobs and find real jobs and all that kind of stuff, okay? And here's what he wrote to me. I'm not gonna, it's so long, I'm not gonna read all of you. I want you to hear this. So this, is a, so this guy's visiting He's a Christian counselor in Raleigh, but he came because his friend was getting baptized. And he wrote this to me. Listen to this. I was especially moved by your invitation and challenge toward the end to the single men to be engaged in the next 16 months for couples to start having kids, for men to lose weight, and so forth. I've never heard such direct, practical challenges in a truthful but gracious way. Well, thank you. 
When you brought up single men, this is what I, what I want to read up. When you brought up single men, many living with their parents, I sensed a move within me to possibly connect with you. As you essentially pointed out that there's a massive issue happening with single men and then subsequently the impact on single women. I heard a stat recently, it's estimated that 45% of women aged 25 to 44 will be single by 2030 in America. And he, this is a Morgan Stanley study. As you can foresee, if this continues, it will lead to societal collapse. One reason is men are not pursuing women. The parents of these men have not helped them. Prolonged adolescence as a result of parenting enablement in our culture has killed these men. There's a conflicting message to single men. If they're perceived as ugly and they approach a woman, that makes them creepy and perverted. But if they don't pursue a woman, they're passive. Well, then what should they do? Listen to this. I couldn't believe this when he wrote this to me. So now I have seven to nine single male clients that have chosen to cultivate a relationship with an AI girlfriend who will never reject them or criticize them. Having facilitated over 9,000 sessions in the last six years, it's more obvious than ever that we need to equip parents to equip and release their adult sons. And if those parents won't, how can the church equip the men to respect themselves and do hard things, including facing rejection or doing the hard work of cultivating authentic intimacy? Okay. That's why I'm just like, this is, this is a zeitgeist moment in our church. This is a moment in our culture. And I'm trying to deal with the prevalent, pre, 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 prevalent? Prevalent, thank you, prevalent, okay. <laughs> Prevalent, prevalent problem of elongated singleness, which is so heartbreaking for so many. Um, historically, there are three, people, three ways people move from, I gotta do these quick, from single to spouse. The first is arranged marriages, okay? We're not doing that, obviously, but here's what I want you to know. The, if you don't like arranged marriages, you don't like the story of Adam and Eve because it's an arranged marriage. Uh, it's the story of how Abraham found a, a wife for Isaac. Listen, here's the principle with, with arranged marriages. Parents pick. And, uh, in the, and honestly, most places around the world where this happens, the marriages are very happy and they last for a very long time. They seem to be very, very successful. Why? Because parents know their children. This is why the first question I ask after the whole vow question with premarital counseling is literally, people come to my house for the first time, we're doing premarital counseling. First question, hey guys, oh, nice to meet you, nice to meet you. Real quick, uh, do either of your parents have any concerns with this relationship? I don't ask if they're Christians. Because parents know their kids, and I want to know that. But arranged marriages, is that's not going to happen. Then there's courting. Some of you never even heard of courting, but courting was what everybody did until 1900. And courting is where the dad is directly involved with the daughter in the dating relationship. It's kind of, I know it sounds strange to us today, but it's almost like the young man dates the daughter and also dates the dad. He's like, I wasn't ready for this, okay? Um, <clears throat> but basically, you know, th this, is, this is the story of Jacob and Rachel. Jacob and Rachel, you know, Jacob, Jacob wants Rachel. He has to go through Rachel's dad to get Rachel, if you know this story. Listen, here, here's the whole point. We're now in a new, the wild, wild west that is called dating. And dating is trying to move from me to we without any help. It's trying to move from me to we without any oversight. The first time that we ever see the word dating is 1896. It's not that long ago. And the first time, again, hold on as I say this, I'm gonna explain this. But the first time the word dating shows up, it's in connection to prostitution. Because you gotta understand, people were trying to figure out what is this thing where a guy, he doesn't pay for sex, instead he just takes a girl out a couple times and he's nice to her and then he gets sexual favors. And they called that dating. Now I think it can be redeemed, I think it has been redeemed. It can be redeemed in Christian culture especially. But dating is, so there's two types of dating, right? There's recreational dating, which we would warn against. Recreational dating is dating with no purpose. In culture, it's like the hookup, shack up, break up culture that destroys people's lives, okay? Definitely the women especially. But in, 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 in church culture, there could be recreational dating, which is like you get emotionally and relationally and spiritually and then you can't do those three without getting physically entangled with somebody for a period of time. And then it doesn't work out. 
and then you got intermingled with a person who's going to eventually be somebody else's spouse. It's not great. And I just want to say this. We have a couple men in this church, and you know who you are, and I just want to speak to you real quick. We have a couple, and this came up more recently. We have a couple young men in this church, and you have a reputation for doing recreational dating in our church. And it is hurting a lot of women. It is hurting a lot of community groups. And I know you look around and you think, I could be anonymous. This is a big church. This church is not as big as you think it is. And I promise you, the elders and the pastors of the church, we know who you are. We talk about you. It's not okay what you're doing. And here's what you need to know. You, all you have is your reputation. That's it. That is all you have. And the last thing you want to do is have a bad reputation. You do not want to have that. So if that's you, you know who you are. You need to repent. You need to ask those girls for forgiveness. And if you're going to pursue someone, you need to get serious about it, okay? On to intentional dating. I want to talk about intentional dating. There are five. Here we go. There are... There are five principles of intentional dating. These are so important. They're so basic, but we have to talk about them. Principle one, maximize your singleness, okay? Singleness is a season and stage of life for most people still. Okay, so if you got married at 40 and you lived a normal life, normal lifespan, you'd still be married longer than you're gonna be single. Singleness is a season, and the way the Bible talks about singleness, I've given whole sermons on this before, it's a divine enablement to do a unique amount of ministry because you're unhindered by anything else. Like a lady was telling me a story about this 23-year-old nun, and I don't even believe in the nuns, N-U-N-S. I mean, I'm not, I'm not Catholic, okay? But she told me the story. She said there was this 23-year-old nun, and the nun was talking to her, and she said, I'm 23, and I'm, I just went into the monastery, and I can't believe I get to be single the rest of my life. I can't believe I get to give myself fully and holy to the church and to the mission of God. Okay, well, that's a, that's what it, like, that's, a, that's a, that's the ideal person of a single, uh, ideal picture of a single person. So the first is, you know, maximize your singles. The second is have the right goal in dating, right? The, the, the whole, intentional dating means that you have intentions. The goal of dating is marriage, obviously, Right? Think about it this way. Dating, this is why you don't need to date when you're, some high schools would be mad that I say this, but you don't need to date when you're young because it's just, it's just a mess. And it gives you the liver, quiver, shiver, livers, whatever they call those things. Okay? But, you, but you know, it gives you all those feelings, but it's just like, you, you don't, because, because it, you just don't need it. I mean, here's the thing. Dating is temporary housing. It's, it, uh, that's what it is. When you, engagement is temporary housing. When someone's like, uh, we were dating for six years and we're so excited, we just got engaged and the wedding is July of 2027. It's like, oh gosh. No one, no one celebrates at that wedding. No one does. Everyone's like, oh, okay. To her live-in boyfriend of six years. <laughs> um, dating is temporary housing. When I was at Elon University, they built temporary housing. The university was exploding. They built temporary housing. And then they couldn't find more land to build the new housing. And so the students had to live in this temporary housing for like a decade. Like these students would come in. And it was always everybody's last pick. Because temporary housing is not meant to be lived in long term. <laughs> so maximize your singleness. Have the right goal. Here it is. Intimacy and commitment are designed to be connected. Intimacy and commitment are designed to be connected. So everyone gets in trouble because they ask, what's the line, right? How much can I do, you know, and all that? Where can we go? How far can we go? Well, here's, here's the way to think about it. Before, until she is your spouse, she is your sister. And so a good rule of thumb is don't do anything to your, to your girlfriend that you wouldn't do to your sister until she's your spouse. And I know people are like, oh, no, no, I said, no, we're good, we're good, we can make out in the dark. It's like, good luck. That's, that's, that's called merging. God created that to merge onto the super highway. That is not a place where you stop and hang out. So there's that. Oh, here's another one. Date in community, right? Here's how you'll know if you have a good guy or a bad guy in your life, or a good girl and a bad girl in your life. A good guy and a good girl says, I, take me into your life. I want to meet your parents. I want to meet your pastors. I want to see your friends. That's what a good guy and a good girl does. A bad guy and a bad girl keeps trying to, eh, you don't want to be with them. Come over here. Let's spend all of our time alone. It's like, listen, you, you need time alone. You need to look at each other in the eyes. You need to go on a walk. You need to hang out. I get all that. But you, 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 need, you need to spend time in community because you need to see 
who each other really are. You're on your best behavior. You're showing your best self when it's just kind of you and you. Know, you need to see his friends. You need to see her friends. And then finally, you need to have biblical expectations. Okay, there's only four expectations. Okay, okay, so if you said to yourself, what should I look for in a man? What should I look for in a woman? Okay, here it is. I'll make them real quick. Okay, number one, somebody of the opposite sex. It's 2024, so we have to say this. Men date women, women date men. Number two, a Christian. Yeah, and, and we're not trying to like, look, you have to understand, all this is for human flourishing. Oh, why do I have, if I'm a Christian, why do I have to date a Christian? Okay, here's why. Because you want to have the same authority and the same community in your life. That's like, whenever, you know, I've done a lot of weddings here, I told you that earlier. And anytime, like, some young couple, like, you know, they're in our church, and they, maybe they became Christians in our church, I don't know, and they're, they're, they're dating in our church, now they're engaged in our church, they're gonna get married and stay in our church. I'm like, guys, listen, marriage is really hard, but, like, 50% of your problems are already solved. Because if you're both Christians, then you have a higher authority. And what you need in marriage is a higher authority that you both agree on, that you can appeal to, that isn't you. And outside of that, what are you going to have? Dr. Phil? Uh, yeah, what did Dr. Phil say about What did Oprah say about hey, We should all listen to this podcast. It's like, no, you need a higher authority. Then you need a community, right? You need a community, not your drinking buddies who every time you talk about your wife, they're like, yeah, she's an idiot and you should probably leave her. You don't need that. You, you need like people are like, I am so excited. I value marriage. I want to see you guys make it long term. Let's go. So, okay, so you, simple. Opposite sex, Christian. Okay, now I'm going to walk where angels fear to tread, but attraction. Okay, now attraction is a really interesting thing, okay, because you can't help who you're attracted to. What is, it, what, what is attraction? Attraction is interest in another person. And you can't control your interests. This is why, like, some of you, you just, like, you wanted to be a doctor, but you're like, I, I hate organic chemistry. It's like, you, you can't make yourself be interested in something you're not interested in. So you need to pay attention to who you're attracted to. You just, you look at that guy, you look at that girl, you go, he looks like he takes his vitamins. You know what I'm saying? Like, you're just like, you're just like, ah, I got the feelings. Now, here's another thing about, about, about attraction. Attraction, this is encouraging. Attraction can grow. Here's why. When you see somebody, you, think about how little of, of a person you see. It's like, well, I see you now. I don't see you in the future or in the past. I see the front of you. I see a little bit of you because you're mostly covered in clothing. I, I, I see, um, I don't see your past. I don't see your family. I don't see your personality. I don't see your interest. So here, and you'll know this if you've ever done this. The more you get to know somebody, the more of them you see. And so the encouraging thing is if there's a little bit of attraction there, who knows that it might, it couldn't increase and you could find yourself more and more attracted. Finally, you have to be equally yoked. So that's the four things. Opposite sex, Christian, that I'm attracted to, and that we're equally yoked. That just means we're headed in the same direction. If you're a missionary, you have to marry and date a missionary, right? I mean, every once in a while, someone's like, Kyle, how did you get Margie to do it? Do what? Ah, to stay home, to want to have kids, to support your ministry. It's like, we didn't arm wrestle about this. We've been having this conversation for 15 years. This is, we, had, we started this conversation when we were dating. Well, you want to do this and I want to do that, and that sounds like the same thing, so maybe we should link our lives together and do this together. Okay, now, specifically, some advice to the men and advice to the women. <laughs> okay, because we've got to talk to the men, because men have to leave, right? So here's, here's, here's for the guys, all right? Five quick things for the guys. I, I'm breaking every, by the way, every preaching rule ever. Like, make, make sure your sermon has three points. It's like, mine has 18, okay, so... <laughs> <clears throat> but, but this is for the men and then for the women, okay. Uh, men, you must initiate and lead, okay? You can't text. You can't slide into her DMs, okay? Yes, I know what that means, okay? Because um, I had a staff person tell me what it means. Okay, now listen. <clears throat> you, you can't ask her friend. To check. You, got, you got to take the risk, okay? You have to risk. You have to risk, okay? Here's the other thing, okay? This will be wild, widely controversial, but also very, very helpful, okay? Okay. Um, if you are a 25 to 35-year-old man and you are single, for all, I'll, let, I'll say maybe there's an exception, but probably not. For almost all of you, if you're 25 to 35 and you're single, there is nothing, nothing, nothing more important in your life than finding a spouse. It is more important than your job. It is more important than your goofy friends. It is more important than all of your hobbies. It is actually becoming more important than your relationship with your mom and your dad and your brother and your sister. It is so unbelievably important. The third thing that men need to hear, get ready for this. Have realistic expectations. 
Some of you are a six and you're going after a 10. (laughs) The perfect woman doesn't exist. She's a figment of your imagination. And if she existed and she met you, she'd run away screaming. (laughs) You know this. It's like, look, the world is way too complicated for you to go through all four billion women. So here's what you need to do. You need to go, okay, here's what I need to do. I need to stop focusing on the one, the one, the one, and I need to start paying attention to the ones that God has put in front of me. Here's another thing for men. Men need to hear this. Get ready to be rejected. You're like, this is so encouraging. You know? <laughs> yes, get ready to be rejected. Um, no, I mean, <laughs> okay. It's, like, it's just, if you're, gonna, if you're gonna try to date some girl, your second favorite word better be no, okay? Because <laughs> you might be hearing it a lot. No. Here's what happens. Like men need to risk and then they're rejected. And on, on, a, on a real, on a note, being rejected is, um, it's very hard on a man. You know, genuinely it is. Even though women do it in a very kind way, men can take it very personal. Here's what I'm saying. If you're being rejected, there's three things. You know, maybe you went after the wrong type of lady and she's got her too high expectations. That's partly. Number two, maybe, genuinely, maybe you went outside of your league. You aimed too, good for you, but you aimed too high. Come down a little bit, Okay. Uh, Number three, seriously, maybe there's something wrong with you that you need to change. Amen. That is a a dad of a daughter, okay? (laughs) Now, well, think about it. Think about this. If every woman is rejecting me, huh? What does that all have in common? You! (laughs) Right? And then you see these incel groups. You know what they are? Involuntary celibate. Oh, they're scary. Um, they're on the internet and they're angry because every woman has rejected them. It's like, okay, which leads to the final thing for men. Take care of yourself physically. Have two eyebrows instead of one eyebrow. (laughs) (laughs) Buy clothes that fit. Find cologne and don't wear too much of it. You know, I mean, put your best foot forward. To the women, okay, here, quickly, and and I did consult women on this um, to to hear some insights, okay. Number one, uh, for women, um, it's, so you don't be passive. Don't be a doormat, don't be acting like you can't do anything. Be like Ruth and get in a guy's way and hope it works out. It's a a group of friends are hanging out, you can invite him to, to hang out with a group of friends. You can give, as one of my friends calls, good green lights. Hey, I don't really do group me a lot, I'm, it's easier to reach me on my personal phone number. <laughs> and guys need to pay it. The guys, oh, okay, a per, three, three, six, you know. <laughs> so, so it's okay to drop the hanky and get in the guy's way, okay? All right, that, so that's, uh, you know, all the ladies are like, great, 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 great. Here's the, here's the, here's the harder word to ladies. Re, this is the second thing for ladies. Realize when he's not into you. If after this sermon, you're hanging around the guy, hoping it's been weeks or it's been a month or two, and he, he, you're just hoping he's going to ask you out, I, I hate to break it to you. He's not into you. And that's, that's hard, right? Women, women, men get rejected with the word no. Women get rejected by not being asked. And it's hard on both of us. Which leads to the third thing for women. Stop having such high expectations. Okay, I know, I know some of you. I'm looking for a guy in finance. Trust fund, <laughs> six, five. Yeah, I know it, that went viral. Okay, um, <laughs> listen. Okay, I looked this up this week. Do you know how many men are over six feet tall and make six figures in America? 3% of the population. And I hate to break it to you, they're married. <laughs> okay, we have, we have... <laughs> So, you know, when people were young, it's like, ah, he doesn't make a lot, and I don't make a lot, and we'll figure it out together. But you get, you know, you're 38, and you're like, well, we need to buy the Brookberry house right away. We need to be able to send our kids to Precise Country Day School right away. I need to be able to be a member of the country club right away. It's like, come on. We have two high expectations. <clears throat> two last things for the women. Um, okay, this is, I think, really helpful. Be willing to go on one date with most guys. If they're good, godly guys, if there's even potentially the littlest potential spark of maybe attraction, 
No, here, what's what I'm trying to say? Know the difference between going on a date and dating. You, you know, you could go on one date. It doesn't mean he's your boyfriend. It doesn't mean you're his girlfriend. It might just be mutually edifying and mutually encouraging. And maybe then you go your separate way as friends, or maybe an attraction blossoms. Which leads to the final thing, which is, ladies, relax and guard your heart. In other words, sometimes, in, in, so here's what I see in churches. Because the culture is so relaxed about dating, we're so intense about dating. It's like, you know, you're on the second date with him and you're thinking, how, would, how many syllables are in his last name? And, and he's thinking, what well, is she going to order off the menu? You know, you're, think, you're looking at him going, what will our kids look like? And he's like, she's wearing blue and has brown hair. That's what, she, that's what he's thinking. <laughs> he's not where you are, okay? Guys, we're going to figure this out together. The picture of all of this, by the way, is Jesus Christ. Let me show you a verse. Paul in Ephesians chapter five says this as we close. He says, therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. I, that's what we've been talking about, but look at what he says. Look here. This mystery is profound, and I'm actually saying that it refers to Christ and the church. If you're single, especially a single man, I know we hit on things hard to grow up, to get out, to initiate, but it's only because the Lord Jesus Christ is the example. Jesus Christ left his father, left his father's house, left his home in heaven, and traveled a long distance as the model husband pursuing his wife. And not only did he do that, but then he made vows to her. Vows that he would be faithful unto death, and that's exactly what he did with his life and his death and his resurrection. And the Bible actually says in 1 Corinthians 6 that when a person becomes a Christian, you can go read this later, it says we become one spirit with Jesus Christ. So the Bible says in marriage, you become one flesh. But when you are united to Christ by faith, you actually become one spirit with him. And Jesus' efficacious love, which is a love that changes and transforms us, works inside of us. Let me say this final word too. So some of you came in here, we said this at the beginning, you can have a new marriage with the same spouse. Some of you, marriage is so difficult. And I wanna continue to say two things. One, we wanna come alongside you and help you wherever you are. But two, I want us to look at Jesus Christ in the gospel because Jesus has been in the worst, most dysfunctional marriage imaginable for 2,000 years. And he is the model example of how to love a church even while that church is crucifying him. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the men and women in here. Would you help us to elevate marriage appropriately, to elevate singleness appropriately? Would you help the men and women in this church to take their next step to move from single to spouse, if that might be what you'd call them to, Lord? Would we have a, a community of intentional dating, not recreational dating, Lord? Would, would, we, would you bring some older married couples around so that there could be a healthy level of influence and oversight as people try to navigate the crazy terrain that is today's dating world? We pray this in Christ's name, amen.